den der lektør i CTS, Amos, kultur, skræk jeg af, når jeg har fået mig lektør i vores geofli, med den søg. Så, jeg vil godt have lagt til dig, at jeg har hørt, at vi har talt meget om storyboards, og det er en intuitiv metafor,
But the other story was its totality is that it compass space, time, and individuated existence. So the individuated existence uh, are represented by uh, dots. So uh, story wars are not just spatial, they are spatial uh, temporal, they have a uh, history. Uh, so you can imagine them as a big container for everything that is told in the stories. Uh, I even put events as uh, part of the story world in contract to Giorgio. <laughs> because um, uh, events affect uh, material uh, entities. So a uh, story world is basically something material, but events change uh, material entities. So I think they are part of the story world. So one way to consider story world is as a container. The other way on the right, they can be considered as a network of relations between the characters in the story. Um, there are uh, many different uh, relations between text and story worlds. Um, Every text, any narrative text uh, projects a story world, but story world has a certain independence uh, from text. So one of these relations is to have one text and uh, several worlds and several stories. And this happens in narratives such as uh, Ron or Ron, when you have three different uh, uh, sequence of events that are developed out of the same situation. Uh, butterfly effect is a good example of uh, French Newton and Woman, it's uh, a novel with two different uh, endings. So all these uh, chains of events are incompatible with each other, but they are coherent, so if you stay on the same storyline, so they can be said to represent a uh, different world. The second, you can have one text, one author, one world, but many stories in it. And uh, this happens, for instance, um, in the, this novel, Cloud Atlas, you know Cloud Atlas. There was a, this was a famous novel that was turned into a movie. So here you have one world and you have different stories that take place at different times in the same world. But how do you know it's the same world? It's because there are objects that are transferred from one story to another. Another example is Babel, which is a movie uh, where you have three different stories, but they take place at the same time, <coughs> but in different countries, one in Japan, one in Morocco, one in Mexico, and again, characters can uh, telephone from one story to the next, so you know that they are part uh, of the same uh, world. Then uh, you can have uh, one world, many texts, many stories, and that's what happens in the uh, that, First in series of uh, novels, uh, I'm thinking of a movie like Balzac or even Proust, or may, uh, science fiction authors do that a lot. For instance, As Asimov wrote several series of novels, there was a robot series, there was a foundation series. So they create all the uh, novels of the same series belong to the same uh, story world. And here is the case of uh, uh, one more many text, many stories, monomedia, uh, all novels, but of course, when you have a transmedia uh, system such as Star Wars, then uh, you have films, you have comics, etc. Et so, <coughs> now I'd like to uh, discuss the case of uh, the distance of a story world uh, from the actual. So the most general way to assess the ontological distance relies on the possibility of uh, a story being realized in the actual world. And the story world can have three basic types of relation to the actual world. It can be, first it can be verified in the actual world, that the uh, picture on left, and that's what happens when the story is told as non-fiction and happens to be true. If it's false, of course, it would be uh, outside of the actual world. Then you can have stories that could happen in the actual world. Uh, this is when the story does not really change uh, the laws of physics, when it does not introduce the 
doen naar zo'n karakter of zo, hoe die daad, iets respect voor geografie en iets respect de historie op die actie gewoon. Dat wat we hebben in uh, 19th century realistic novels, uh, een story like Emma Bovary, uh, what does the novelist do? It, he adds a uh, certain number of additional characters, but the story could have happened. In fact, uh, Flaubert got the idea of reading uh, something in newspaper. And then you have, of course, the case of the fantasy. It could never happen in the actual world because it uh, expands the number of species. You have orcs, you have elves, you have fairies, you have magical events such as people being transformed into animals. Uh, so that is the case of uh, fantasy. But this is not all the years. Uh, when you have a, a work of fantasy, it remains logically consistent. I mean, you can be transforming, princes can be transforming into toads, but this does not break the laws of uh, logic. The laws of logic, uh, you have first the law of non contradiction. You, can have not, you cannot have P and not P, and you have, must have either P or not P. So they, non contradiction and excluded middle. So uh, in fantasy, uh, you still uh, respect the laws of uh, logic. So you can still say that you construct uh, a world. Now, uh, do uh, works that uh, break the laws of logic construct a world or not? Well, uh, opinions are divided on this according to logicians. When you have a single contradiction in a system, then you cannot make any inference and everything can happen and you don't have a world. I think that uh, this goes a little bit too far. There are some uh, uh, works of uh, narrative that have contradictions but limit these contradictions to certain areas of the story world and you can still uh, make inferences. So, um, there are two types of contradictions. There are systematic contradictions. So here's a nonsense rhyme. A young old man sitting on a stool was reading his newspaper that was folded in his pocket by the light of a street light that had been turned off. So the point of such a text is really to play with the idea of contradiction as to file as many contradictions as possible. So it's a game, a game of contradiction. So I would say that this does not construct a war. Uh, then, uh, in the French new novel, you have also a play with contradiction, contradiction for their own sake. <coughs> so here's um, how um, Lubomir Golojel analyzes uh, this book by Pompilier. When I'm in the city event, it introduced uh, in several conflicting versions of this Hong Kong is and is not the setting of the novel. The same events are ordered in the of the temporal sequences A, B, C, B, and C, B, C, A, and for one of the same authentic figures in several modes of existence as a literary fiction of fact and the field of performance as a sculpture and painting. So I think for for Gabriel introducing contradiction and destroying the idea of, uh, of storyboard was indeed the name of the game. That would mean that. Uh, it takes it absurd on a certain level, but it doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't make sense to, 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 to try this. That was a literary experiment. He wanted to uh, uh, subvert the convention of uh, traditional narrative. But I think there are some texts that uh, contain contradictions where it's not a systematic game, but these contradictions are the result of a, a plot device, a plot device that is itself very interesting, and I'm especially thinking about time travel. Time travel leads to all sorts of uh, logical contradictions. If you have a character who travels in the past, and he meets his grandfather, and he uh, kills his grandfather, then he will be, never be born, therefore he will not travel into the past, therefore if he doesn't travel into the past, he does not meet his grandfather, and so this leads to a so, uh, um, science fiction, I mean, uh, time travel is notorious for uh, creating logical contradictions, but I think there are lots of fascinating uh, novels and films that use time travel, and we kind of close our eyes on this contradiction. And I think we still make inferences, we still uh, uh, speculate about. 
about the motivation of the characters. So I think we treat these uh, books as or these uh, narratives as a, a piece of Swiss cheese. They have logical holes, but around the logical holes there are still some substance and there is still a story that's been told. Another kind of uh, a plot that leads to logical contradiction, but I think it does not destroy the entire uh, story world, is what's known as metalepsis. Metalepsis is when you have uh, an author who meets his characters. I mean, the author belongs to one world and the characters to another world, and in principle they cannot meet because they belong to uh, different ontological levels. There's a famous story by Woody Allen where there's this guy who falls in love with Madame Bovary. He lives in New York City, she lives in France, but somehow uh, she travels to New York City and they have a long affair. And the professors at Harvard are quite upset because they open a book and things happen that did not have happen in the original version. So this is the case of metalipsis, uh, so logical contradiction that are in the top of the plot and still leads to interesting narrative uh, situations. Okay, next um, I'd like to talk about the size of the story world. So the size of the story world, the function of the amount of information that uh, you have about the world. So uh, Ten Charles Creed's narrative has a huge story world. Uh, uh, 300 page narrative has a medium sized story world. There are some genres that, by definition, a very small story world, and to be of jokes, of uh, uh, short stories, and especially a genre that has become uh, fashionable recently, uh, micro fiction. So I, here I'd like to take a look at the problem raised by the two extremes, very small story worlds and very large story worlds. So, um, if you give a negative truth value to every imaginable proposition, except for the proposition, there is a rock, there is a tree, and there is a house, we generate a very small story world. Uh, there are only three objects, and I don't know how you could develop a narrative, but this is an example of a minimal, uh, minimal possible world. So if you can have a, a world, a possible world that has only a rock, uh, a tree, and a house, you could also have this. This is a famous example given by a novelist Ian Forster as an example of plot. He didn't give this as an example of uh, aesthetic fiction. It was just what uh, a novel must have in order to have a plot. The king died and the queen died of grief. But we can uh, regard this as uh, an autonomous narrative, so that would be a very small uh, story world. I think it's you can say it's a story world, maybe in a logical sense, because it's a fairly complete story. You don't have to add anything to understand what's going on. But it's not a story world in a phenomenological or experiential sense. Because I think it lacks the ability to stimulate the imagination. You read this text uh, as a collection of propositions. You uh, give them truth value. You must assume that it's Proposition is true in a story world, but uh, you don't try to flesh out this world. You don't try to imagine the queen on her deathbed. You don't ask questions such as, uh, did the king love her as much as he loved him? You just read this and uh, you swallow the information. That's all there is to it. So um, as you process this, as you process a summary of the narrative. When you read a summary, you don't have an aesthetic uh, relation to the summary. You do not enjoy the summary. So when you read summaries, it's to find out if maybe you would love the, the narrative when you read the real thing. And this could very well be a summary of a fascinating novel that will uh, stir the imagination. But the way it is, I think it's just a bunch of uh, propositions. On the other hand, I'd like to, to contrast it 
baby shoes, never more. I don't know how he react to it, but I find the second example much more moving than the first one. And I am much more tempted to construct a story world around it. And the reason being that um, it leaves lots uh, to be imagined. It's not complete. You have to imagine the background. So I imagine a mother who bought everything for her baby, and then the baby tra uh, tragically died, and uh, she had to, she's so poor that she had to sell everything, or maybe she could understand the size of, of the shoes because it reminds her of her dead baby. So, then, so this is a, a tragic story for me. Well, the, the, the first example, which also represents tragic events, doesn't move me at all. So I would say, but this is my personal reaction, that the second example has a very small story world, but it, it's more than a culture of opposition. I engage uh, emotionally with it. Well, uh, the first one does not. So I think uh, there is no really uh, objective criterion whether uh, the text has a story world or not. Uh, it's how we engage with the content. But this leads to, I think, what is uh, Principle uh, the criterion of oneness. When a text creates a world, we imagine that there is more to this world than the text uh, represents. Now I will move to the, uh, the case of very large story books. And uh, it's represented by the case of uh, transfictionality and transmedia storytelling. And transfictionality uh, has been defined by Richard saint who wrote a huge book uh, to a case, but unfortunately it's in French, but and it's not been translated, but uh, if you can read uh, French, I really recommend it. It's uh, really an encyclopedia of uh, transfictionality. So what is transfictionality? The sharing of elements, mostly characters, but also uh, locations, events, and even in the entire world by two or more works of fiction. And when you combine transfictionality with adaptation, you get transmedia storytelling. Uh, transmedia storytelling, the phenomenon that has produced Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. It is transfictional because you have lots of different narratives with the same characters, same events, but it's also uh, a case of adaptation because it uh, uses different uh, media. So, um, transfictionality relies on a number of uh, operations. The first one is expansion, which adds new stories to the fictional world, but respects the facts that are established by the originals, with respect to the canon. Then you have modification, which changes the plot of the original narrative, for instance, by giving it a, a different ending. And then you can have transposition, which transforms the plot into a different temporal or spatial setting. So an example would be the musical West Side Story, which transposes the story of Romeo and Juliet into uh, New York City of the 50s. And then there is perhaps a different operation, the mashup or crossover. That's an operation that allows characters imported from different narratives to coexist within the same story. And so it makes it possible for the heroes of a different uh, novel to meet. A good example is a comic book series called The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which where you can find uh, Captain Demo from the Shower Leagues Under the Sea, you can find Dr. Jekyll from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Professor Moriarty from Sherlock Holmes. Another example of um, a <coughs> when generic story worlds are contaminated by foreign elements. For instance, for instance, when the aristocratic world of Jane Austen is invaded by creatures from the other genre, and you get the fight and prejudice and uh, zombies. So, um, Marshall and crossovers create a brand new story world through a process of hybridization. You take half the element from one type of world and the other half from uh, another uh, type of world. The question is, is that 
Een auto doen we op de Rissel, in de Rissel doen we first three, or can it be reduced to uh, modification of uh, transposition? You could say that uh, private prejudice and zombies is really a modification because the author has added zombies to the world of uh, private prejudice, or you could say that it's a transposition because the same plot has been moved to a world uh, where they, they so I'm not quite sure that uh, Lashot is an autonomous operation in addition to the three, but it's certainly a very popular uh, way of uh, creating storyboards. All three of these operations can be found in postmodern fiction. That's one of the trademark of postmodern fiction. It likes to take uh, existing story and uh, do something. But I think only the first uh, operation expansion is acceptable for the fans of the transmedia franchise uh, such as uh, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings because expansion is the only one that respects the integrity of the story world. So when you have expansion, the story world established on the basis of all the text is free of uh, contradiction. But when you have modification, uh, you have contradictory versions that challenge the logical consistency of the story world. And uh, modification is widely practiced in fan fiction because by definition fan fiction is not canonical, so fans can do whatever they want. But um, uh, developer owners of the copyrights of uh, uh, franchises do not like uh, uh, modification, they don't like transposition, so they, they try to uh, prevent it and they do this uh, uh, in various ways. First, they create a compilation of facts known as Bibles, and if you are an author and you are going to, to write a new uh, Star Wars novel, you have to follow the Bible, you have to follow the facts that are established in the Bible. And then the other way to, to control expansion of the story world without introducing contradiction is of course by declaring a certain uh, numbers of texts as canonical, as you, you know what happened with Star Wars, I mean there are so many Star Wars uh, novels, uh, comics, games, etc. that when it was sold to Disney uh, Company, the Disney Company threw away most of the canon, they kept only uh, six movies and uh, a TV series that had been in 2008. And so they started from a very small canon, but now they are expanding it widely. And I think that uh, in the year uh, 2015, at least 40 different novels uh, with the Star Wars logo was, uh, were uh, written. So the canon is expanding a bit. Now, what happens when uh, a text used to be canonical and it's been thrown away? Uh, it's no longer in the part of the canon. Well, I think the theory of possible worlds has a nice explanation for it. It used to be part of the actual world of uh, the system, and now it becomes a natural possible world. Finally, uh, the short operation transposition creates an entirely different story world, and I think it conflicts uh, with the main reason for the popularity of transmedia franchises, the main reason is the loyalty of audiences uh, to a given world. People want more and more information about the world. They want to be transported into to the world of Star Wars. They don't really care what happens in it, but they want a certain visual decor. They, they want a, a certain character. So if you took the plot of Star Wars and you transposed it into a setting, I think the fans would be upset and it would not be uh, successful. So I don't think you have transposition in uh, uh, transmedia franchise. You may have transposition in fan fiction because they can do whatever they want. And then the, the next uh, topic I will address is ontological completeness. Que question of ontological completeness has been one of the most controversial issues uh, when you apply possible world theory to story world. For the world to be ontologically complete, it means that every 
opposition must be either true or false in this world. And uh, you, um, if a proposition were neither true nor false, you would have uh, the middle. And the idea of the excluded middle is uh, one of the basis of logic. So the question is, um, are uh, the world of fiction like uh, the one on the left, an ontologically complete world, or do they have ontological holes? Uh, here I will uh, quote Lubomir Bologel, and he writes, it would take a text of infinite length to construct a complete fictional world. Finite texts, the only texts that human are capable of producing, are bound to create incomplete worlds. For this reason, incompleteness, the universal property of fictional world structure. And why are uh, fictional worlds uh, necessarily incomplete for Bologel? cannot specify for any proposition whether it's true or false. There has been a famous controversy about this topic. It's the controversy of the number of children of Lady Macbeth. And I think in the 1920s or 30s, critics were de debate, de debating, uh, did she have a certain number of children or not? Because Shakespeare never uh, uh, tells her uh, how many children she had. So here I quote to a philosopher, Nicholas Wolsterstorff, we will never know how many children have been in my best. This is not because to know this would require knowledge beyond the capacity of human beings. It's because there is nothing of the sort to know. So it's not something that we do not know. It's something that we can make. So uh, for uh, Dolgen or Wolsterstorff, uh, fictional worlds are like the one on the right. Uh, they are full of uh, uh, places of uncertainty, of proposition that are neither true nor false. I will uh, play with this advocate, and I believe that uh, most uh, stories are accurate. I think the thesis of the incompleteness of fictional story worlds presupposes a perspective that is external to this world. So when we are in a real world and we look at the fictional world, yeah, uh, we know that it, it, it says only a uh, limited number of shrinks and it is full of shrinks that have not been specified. But once we relocate our imagination, once we are immersed in these worlds, we imagine them on the model of the real world. So if I transport myself into the world of uh, Macbeth, I do not imagine Lady Macbeth as a woman who is, has no determined number of children. She's a, 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 a regular person like you and me, and we all have a determined number of children. It's just that it's not known. So once we are inside the fictional world, we treat, uh, we treat uh, places of uh, um, uncertainty as missing information rather than as a, an ontological gap. And uh, take a, a character like Cleopatra. Uh, we don't know how many children she had, but we do not consider her to be logically incomplete. So when we uh, play the main, a game of make believe of fiction, we imagine that uh, Lady Macbeth or Madame Bovary is a real person. She has the same ontological status as a real person, therefore she is ontologically complete. So, but I do not want to say that all works of fiction uh, project complete works. So for me, there are some works that are complete and some that are uh, incomplete, and so I think a, a qualitative uh, attitude on the difference. Uh, some are complete, some are incomplete. Well, if you uh, regard all worlds as incomplete, uh, your uh, distinction is quantitative. There are some worlds that are more complete than others, but they are all incomplete. So I'm going to give you an example of two worlds, one that I consider to be complete and the other that I consider to be incomplete. And I take these words from the theater because the theater makes a sharp contrast between what is shown on the stage and what happens beyond the stage. So uh, this gives a good ind indication of the completeness of the world. If there is something that uh, happens beyond the stage, it means that the world is complete 
there's nothing beyond the stage, it means that the world is uh, incomplete. So uh, the play that I will uh, discuss is when the 17th century French tragedy Phèdre by Jean Racine, and the other one is a very famous 20th century play, On Attendant Godot, Waiting from Godot by Samuel Beckett. Who knows Waiting from Godot? So I will um, start my uh, discussion by using a distinction by uh, a drama theorist named Philip Auslander, who uh, he makes a distinction between two poles in the theatre. There is a mimetic pole, uh, the mimetic pole of narrative representation, uh, play is a <coughs> world, and then there is anti-mimetic pole of pure performance. So when you are in a mimetic pole, you can imagine a world whose time and space extends beyond what's happening on stage, while when you are in a pole of pure performance, uh, there's no more, uh, the time and space are what you see on the stage, but there's nothing else. And it's embodied by the, the bodies of the actors. So a uh, spectacle of modern dance would be uh, a pure performance. So I start with uh, Fedro, uh, and first I start by summarizing the plot. Uh, Fedro is the wife of uh, Thesé, Chereus, you know, the, the guy who uh, uh, killed the Minotaur and escaped from the labyrinths by following Shred. Uh, Shred was given to him by Ariadne, who happened to be the sister of Fred. And then uh, Shereus of Thesé abandoned her on an island and he married Fred. And uh, Fred is his second wife. Uh, he had a son from his first wife named Hippolyte. So at the beginning of the play, uh, Fred is away from his king of Trezen, is away from his kingdom, and Fred is dying of love for her stepson, uh, Hippolyte. And in the uh, ethics of the play, this is considered to be an incestuous love. So um, she cannot have Hippolyte for two reasons, first, uh, because it's incestuous, and second, because it needs to be taisé. And then the news that uh, Thésée has been killed in her life, so that she is afraid of her to uh, fulfill or try to fulfill her love, so she confesses her love to <coughs> Hippolyte, and Hippolyte is of course horrified. So Hippolyte is in love with a young woman named <coughs> Arisi, and he cannot marry Arisi because she belongs to an enemy family. So, uh, Fred declares her love and uh, of course it turns down. And then there is a, what I call a very cheap plot trick. The news comes that Thesee is not dead after all. So this is very embarrassing for Fred because I mean, she's afraid that she should, she should not, she has lost her honor. She's afraid that Hippolyte will tell on her to, to Thesee. So what can she do? And she has a confidence of her nurse in Unon who suggests that uh, Unon will tell Thesé that Hippolyte has tried to force himself sexually on her. So uh, that we uh, say of uh, from being uh, told on by Hippolyte because uh, after uh, Unon tell that to uh, Thesé, Thesé is furious, he banishes Hippolyte from the kingdom and he invokes uh, the god Neptune, asks Neptune to, to punish Hippolyte. Uh, so, um, what happened next? Um, the messenger arrives with the news that Hippolyte has been killed by a sea monster uh, which is represented the god Neptune. Fed is full of remorse, she concentrates her life to Thesé and she dies on stage after having taken the cross. So this is a tragic story. So, um, Fed consists of three circles. First, uh, there is the space uh, and events that are shown on stage. And the space that is shown on stage is a very abstract uh, space because uh, it's in the same space that Hippolyte, uh, she declares her 
Hippolyte, there are some uh, secret conversation that takes place and some very public events. So this is really not a real space, it's a, an abstract space uh, known as the end-type chamber of the palace where everybody can come and go. And why is it such an abstract space? It's because one of the rules of French tragedy said that everything must take place at the same time and in the same place. Unity of space and time. Then, uh, so everything that you see on stage is part of the first circle. Second circle is events that take place outside of the stage but are very much part of the plot. Um, and um, these events are not enacted, they are narrated. And um, there was a, a rule of French tragedy that said you couldn't show uh, violent events, but you could tell about them. So uh, one of the events uh, that belongs to the second circle is um, the narration of the horrible death of Hippolyte. I mean, there is a really long passage that describes the whole gory detail how he's being uh, torn apart by the sea monster. So, uh, in the first circle, that the events that are enacted, but in the second circle, that the events that are narrated. <coughs> then you have a third circle. Uh, I think that the implicit uh, uh, space and time of uh, the story world. So, <coughs> according to the principle of minimal departure, if you mention one real world uh, location in the story, you can imagine that the entire geography of the real world is part of the story world, even if it's not mentioned. So, um, the whole geography of Greece is part of uh, the story world. They mention various places, so um, you can imagine that Athens is part of it, that uh, uh, the islands of the Aegean Sea are part of it. And in fact, in the edition that I used, there is a map of ancient Greece, uh, even though it's really not uh, directly related to the plot, but I think it helps the imagination of uh, the readers. Also, what is part of this short uh, circle is uh, the mythology of uh, Greek mythology, because at one point uh, <coughs> it is mentioned that um, Fed, uh, or rather Hippolyte, cannot become king, even when Thézé uh, is believed to be dead, he cannot become king because he's the son of an Amazon, and an Amazon is a, a foreigner, so he cannot become king. Um, at another point, it's uh, mentioned, oh, it's mentioned, of course, uh, um, Fed mentioned to Hippolyte how much he would have loved to give him the shreds to help him out of the labyrinth. So all these stories, are not meshed within the story book, they are a historical past and they have an effect on the plot. So, in effect, you have three circles that are all very much full with events and uh, with objects. Now, let's uh, move to uh, Golo. So, in Golo, the stage directions say that there is a tree, there's a rock, and there's a county. County Rose, and uh, there are two characters named Vladimir and uh, Estrago. So the first circle is, uh, has a few tricks, it's not completely empty. It's everything that you see on stage and everything that they say. Circle 2. Circle 2 is virtually empty. They are at some point in the, story, in the, in the play young boy who comes and uh, says <coughs> he has a message from Monsieur Godot for, for Vladimir and Estrago. And this uh, message says, Godot will not come tonight. So you could believe from this uh, message that Godot exists in the second, second circle. Because it's given a message to the young boy. That's in the first act. The second act, you have again a young boy who comes on stage, he says, has a message from Godot. Godot will not come tonight. And Vladimir uh, uh, and say, why you then came yesterday? He said, no, I never came. That's the first time I'm coming. So, what do you conclude? Is the boy lying? Uh, was it a different boy? Or does the play contradict uh, the love of uh, 
of contradiction. I don't want to assume a decision how to interpret, but you cannot conclude that Godu exists in the second circle. Because you can give, okay, you take the proposition, a young boy comes and says he has a message from Godu, there are two ways to interpret it. You can uh, give it what in logic is known as a daily ray uh, interpretation. So this implies that there was somebody called Godu who gave a message uh, to the young boy. But you can have also a dedicto interpretation. According to which, the proposition can be true even if Gojo does not exist because it's just what the young boy is saying. He can be right. So if you give a dedicto uh, interpretation to uh, the events of, uh, of the young boy, it does not presuppose that Gojo exists in the second circle. There's a, another episode where you have a character with Pozo in the first act, you can see in the second act is black. But there is no event that takes place between the two acts. You can't even conclude that the second act follows the first act. So um, you cannot uh, imply that there is an event in the second circle that means also black. So in my opinion, there is nothing in the second act. You cannot infer the existence of any event of a character. But in a short circle, uh, which uh, concerns the uh, geographic and uh, uh, historical background. There's no historical uh, allusions, but there are a few real world toponyms that I mentioned. Mention Seine and Seine was as departure. According to the principal meaning of departure, if you mention one place in the real world, uh, the entire geography of the real world is part of the story. I don't think it's the case here. Because first, you don't know anything about uh, Sen and Seni words. Uh, it's purely random that you choose these words. And in the English traduction that was done by Beckett himself, Sen and Seni words become Fordham and Clapham. So he, he, he chose these words, Fordham and Clapham, or Sen and Seni words, purely for their uh, sound and not for their uh, denotation. So I don't think that you can uh, infer that there is more than four hundred platform, more than seven and seven it was in uh, the second uh, circuit. Toward the end of uh, the play, it turns out that uh, space is limited to the space that is uh, shown on the stage. Vladimir and Estrag move to your I don't know why, but they feel threatened. They want to feel. But they cannot flee because there is no elsewhere. So they stay in place. The story world is not only that used to the area on the stage, it's itself a flat area like in, in those uh, supposedly uh, warm view of the Middle Ages where uh, people were supposed to believe that the earth was flat. That never happened, but uh, we like to believe that they did. So uh, the world of uh, Godot flat because when uh, 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 Pozo and Rocky leave the stage, you hear a big noise, they fell from the edge of the world. So uh, the world is a stage and it is flat. At the end of the play, it concludes like that. Well, shall we go, says that? Let's go, and so as time. Then the curtain fall. When there is no space, there's no way, no place we can go. The, Play as there is no space that allows movement, there is no time that allows state. Vladimir and Estragon have always waited for Godot and they will always wait for Godot. They already know each other at the beginning of the play, but you don't know the circumstances of their meeting because they have no personal uh, biography. They seem from time to time to have distinct personalities, but you could give all the lines. Most of the lines of Estragon to Vladimir and most of the lines of Vladimir to Estragon didn't make any difference. So what can you say about them? They do have a belief world. They believe that God exists and they must wait for God. But beyond this belief, you cannot say anything about them. They are not really human beings, uh, they are allegories. 
And I think the principle of minimal departure does not apply to them. Um, we cannot really imagine them on a model of an embodied uh, human being. And I think that the principle of minimal departure does not work in the case of allegories in general. Allegories are flat, so are uh, very minimal destructive. So um, I've shown you this arrow and the mimetic pole and then this and the uh, pole of uh, performance. I think it clearly occupies, uh, Fed clearly occupies the mimetic narrative pole, but Godot is very difficult to categorize because I think it's a little bit more concrete than the spectacle of abstract depth. So I would, uh, I would put it in the middle of uh, the arrow. I think what's interesting about this play is that uh, Vladimir and Estragon have an ontology that is pretty much like art. They believe that time exists, that Godot will come someday and uh, their life will be different when Godot comes. They also believe that space exists and they can leave the state, but they cannot. So there is a conflict between the personal ontology of Vladimir and Estragon and the objective ontology of the story world, if you can still speak of story world, which has no time and uh, space. So, the introduction of the concept of world, of story world in narratology, can be considered a paradigm shift with respect to the literary school that I call textualism, or you may call it deconstruction, or criticism, or uh, post-structuralism. I think that uh, deconstruction, textualism, this was very much a literary school. Uh, they were interested in the written world. Well, uh, the world of all surprised to all media, but that's nice about it. The cultural domain, textualism was about high culture. But, uh, and it was interested in the essence of literature, in uh, uh, what makes literary language literary. I'm also thinking of Russian formalism in this respect. One of the more the approach uh, is interested in all levels of culture. I mean, most people of culture, but also, it's also applicable to high culture. What is the prototype to Jean? Textualist was interested in the essence of uh, Poetic language and it's regarded poetic language as something almost holy. It was almost too holy to speak about it. And so, uh, even though they, they discussed all sorts of texts, I think that poetry was the model <coughs> and they, they analyzed narrative texts on the model of a poet. Well, uh, the world of poetry is interested in narrative and unfortunately it doesn't have much to say about poetry. Conception of meaning for textualism is infinite, and you have an endless deferral, you know, I'm quoting Jacques Derrida. So there was this uh, phrase, the heresy of paraphrase, you can never paraphrase uh, uh, literary meaning because you are always uh, missing something. Uh, uh, literary meaning can only be conveyed in the words that convey it. One in the world of Roche, we have a much more practical uh, the concept of meaning, and here I quote David Holman, it's a blueprint for imagining the world. So if you replace the exact text with different world, uh, different text, but uh, different text that is to imagine the same world, then your two texts are uh, equivalent. What the text is about, in textualism, it was about itself and about language, but everything else was too trivial to be worthy of literary language. Well, in the world of poems, it's about character events, human problems, and versions that really relate to the inevitable life. The notion of textual world, well, textual doesn't really use it, but if it did, it would be uh, the sum of the meanings that uh, um, are projected by the text, and it is absolutely unique to the text. So no two texts can uh, project the same world. Well, uh, in a world approach, you imagine the world as existing independently of the text, uh, and therefore different authors can uh, develop the same world, uh, that's why you can write fan fiction and do things like that, because the world is in a sense independent of the text. If 
pure imagination. And as soon as we read the novel, the, the text is a kind of uh, uh, an airplane or a, a rocket that takes you to the world, but once you are in the world, you forget the text. And the ideal user experience uh, for textuality, it was appreciating the clear language, while well, in the world, of course, it is uh, immersive. So, um, the notion of story world explains a number of cultural phenomena that textualism would gather theoretically. The first one uh, is immersion. Uh, textualism would not uh, accept immersion because when you are immersed, you, you become kind of blind to the medium, you forget the words, while uh, textualism had this uh, kind of uh, signifiers and uh, you do not traverse the signifiers to get the signified. Second, the notion of story world justifies the practice of transactionality. If words are imagined as existing independently of text, they escape the control of the original author and they become expendable. The characters acquire the life of their own and they can be placed in other circumstances than what is described in the original text. And since a possible more sheer tells us that things could have been different from what they are, it becomes uh, possible to create alternatives to establish fictional world. You can uh, create alternatives to uh, Madame Bovary or to Star Wars, uh, place uh, characters in different uh, circumstances. So the notion of story world encourages a mode of reading or, uh, based on imagining, visualizing, and mentally simulating uh, the action, rather than simply extracting the propositional contents of sentences. And uh, these modes of experiencing narrative set no limit of what can be mentally contemplated. So if you imagine Madame Bovary with blue eyes, even though the text never said the color of her eyes, in textuality that would be forbidden because the text doesn't say it, but in, in, the, in the world of course you can imagine her however you want as long as it's not contradicted by the text. So you can imagine too little to understand the text, that's bad, but you cannot imagine too much. And for the Latin notion of story world, it would be difficult to justify fan behavior such as drawing maps, compiling encyclopedias, constructing genealogy, writing fan fiction, and even uh, dressing up as character in the cosplay event. These actions are not strictly necessary to the understanding of the story, but they represent a way to explore the story world beyond what is shown by the text. I think it would be elitist to reject this behavior as infantile, superfluous, or characteristic of popular culture. They demonstra demonstrate the need of fans not only to immerse themselves in story worlds, but to share them with others and to participate in their creation. Ignoring this need in the name of high culture would amount to ignoring the importance of the imaginary, the fantastic, and the fictional for the human life. 